some good old fashioned, tremendous hymns. All hymns, all of them. Thank you. All my sins have been forgiven. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Go to Ecclesiastes 10. Thank you, Pastor Dwayne, for preaching the Word of God last week in my absence with clarity and power. Great message out of Ephesians. Thank you. Thank you, worship team, continuing in song and everybody to sing and worship the Lord today. I, it's just good. We, we had a good time away and we were at a, another church while we were away. It wasn't the same. It was good because it was in the Lord, but so good to be back home. Cheryl and I again had a good time away for a couple of days and good time of refreshment. Um, when uh, I have to celebrate Valentine's Day, it takes at least 48 hours to uh, at least get my wife to defrag from being with me all these years and then give me another chance for another year or so. But we went away for a little bit, and it was very, very good. And uh, thank you all for your support and prayers and for the team that we have around here, tremendous team of men and women that uh, really serve the Lord. As the old phrase goes, you didn't even know I was gone. And uh, that's the best way that it ought to be. A couple of things that I have neglected to mention. Uh, one of them, three Fridays ago, two Fridays? Three Fridays ago, we had our, well, I think it just was two. We had our murder mystery, our uh, dinner theater, and our teenagers. I believe that in the first service, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, but um, our teenagers served during that dinner, and uh, we had 100 and. 20 people in this room here, and if you were here, of course, two Sundays ago, you sat at a table, and some of you were happy, and some of you were sad, <laughs> but it was a little different, and, uh, but it was a leftover from our dinner theater night, and it worked out beautifully. We were able to raise, in your generous gifts and others that visited, over $2,200 for all of those students that served, and uh, for camp. We've uh, bumped the cost of camp to $1,000 this year, so that's not going to do a thing for them. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. No, that will come close to paying for half of their camp, and that's tremendous. Camp is coming up. It'll be the first part of July, so make sure that you be praying about it. Parents, it's the uh, sweetest time as you can find to send your teenager, your middle schooler, your junior high student, your high schooler off to a place where for three or four or five days they're in the Word of God, uh, they're around people that are filled with the Spirit, that are serving them. There's a time of prayer and preaching, and it's really, really a good time, the right kind of time. And if your kids can be there, I know they're doing a lot, but uh, Pastor Josh is scheduled during the dead week of, uh, of State of Missouri, the first part of July. So take the time, put the time aside. I know he'll be sending out more and more information, but I know that there's a lot going on in everybody's summers, maybe vacation week, it can't hit everybody in the breadbasket, but just know that your church is behind your youth ministry, and all of you are, and youth ministry has been very important for 25 years at First Bible Baptist Church. I'm very thankful for the founding pastor having uh, supported me so well in, in, uh, in, a, in such a good way in the youth ministry as a youth pastor for a lot of years, and the team we had, and all the all the camps, the dozens of children that got saved through camp and then discipled and growing in the Lord. It is worth your efforts, worth your gifts of donations. And if you said, hey, I'm compelled to still help out with camp, you can put that on an offering envelope, put down youth summer camp, and those students will be the beneficiaries of all of you giving that money for scholarships to help kids pay, uh, even if it's only 225 or 250 in your minds. The church also does pick up a little of that to help out offset that. And so, again, thank you for being part of that. That's really, really important. Second thing, and I don't know if I forgot to mention it, but is that I do not want to forget. After church service today, you need to do the old chair routine, okay? We need all the chairs picked up in the groups of five, just stacked where they are at, because they're going to come up, and tomorrow there'll be some carpet uh, beginning to go down. Yay. 
And then next Sunday, no more coffee in the car. No more Coca-Cola, Diet Dr. Pepper. Water is legal. That about it. Okay? And we will have a few henchmen at the door. They will be armed <laughs> with a garbage can to dump your water in, or <laughs> dump your drink in. But uh, the carpet is coming, the carpet is coming, the carpet is coming. How do you like all the white lights up there? Huh? Don't I look cute? Uh. Dwayne, I told him he looked much taller last week with the white lights. He much taller on TV, yes. You move the thing all the way up here. Man, I don't know what to do. I'm thinking, whew, don't step out of the light. But again, a lot of neat things going on leading up to our 25th anniversary. On Tuesday, it's March 1st, two months out. Of course, uh, you'll be hearing more and more. Now that we're in the 60-day stretch or whatever they call that. Let me see, March 30 days, has September, April, uh, 61 days. So we've got to get ready for that, and there's a lot of things to be done. And I'm thankful for all of you that are part of and have given to our 25th anniversary celebration remodel. It's, uh, it's looking good. I hope you like it. It's fresh and neat, and when that carpet gets in, it'll be really, really beautiful. So thank you. Lights and uh, some painting and a few other little things, and I'm very thankful again for all of you saying, hey, I'd like to be in on this, be part of this, and we don't spend money on ourselves much. So this is a one-time thing. Uh, have, even having the uh, sound panels redone looks really, really cool. You didn't even notice that they used to be brown and now that they're gray, did you? Go ahead, stare. Go ahead, look. Oh, they're gray now. Oh, very good. Hey, we painted the ceiling too. Yeah. It used to be brown. Now it's white. Did you know that? <laughs> well, it was getting there. Let's just put it that way. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, we're going to walk through these verses this morning as we have been walking through our study and being reminded again of Solomon's plight. Today in these verses, and again, we're entering the last quarter of our study, 12 chapters, 10, 11, 12 coming to you. Today chapter number 10 is very proverbial or proverb-like. Solomon has put a few proverbs in his preaching message, and this is his message to the people Israel. He's gathered them together. He says, I'm the preacher, and he's preaching, and he's basically saying vanity of vanity, all is vanity. He's saying that life under the sun is all vanity. Well, I would agree. In that, without above the sun, without above the heaven, without including the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of creation, the God of new birth in Jesus, your life is vanity. It doesn't mean anything. But when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, it means everything. And now, you have this way that's totally different before you were saved. I remember when I first got saved, it was so different. I was born again. I had this weird type of feeling like I, no sin. There's no, I was forgiven. And the Bible says, all is sin and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. And now I had this eternal life. I knew something was different. I called on the name of the Lord to save me. I believed in my heart. I confessed with my mouth like the scriptures said, according to the scriptures, calling on the name of the Lord. And something happened. And then began a neat new life. And that was in 1983. And it's all these years later. And I realized this choice every day. When I was lost, I had really no choice. I woke up every day living for me. And that was the only one to live for. While I was trying to make my own righteousnesses as Dwayne, and we were singing, he was praying through it. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. That's the way I thought I could live my life until I got saved. I went, wait a minute. It's by the righteousness of God imputed and put into me by the Lord Jesus Christ. New life. You know what Solomon knew all about that new life? God gave him wisdom. Wisdom above everybody. He was anointed God's anointed man. He was set apart by God as the leader of people Israel and God gave him the anointing, the covering. He was God's emissary. 
More than being a king of a nation and getting all kinds of goods and stuff like that, he was given wisdom to a point where he could rule well and lead the people to worship God himself. And yet he lost track. Just like each one of us, every day in our born-again life, if you're a believer today, you can lose track. The wisdom of God is in the word of God. The folly of man is in you. And you can decide whether you want to live the wisdom of God or the folly of man every day. And if you and I continue to just negate the wisdom and neglect the wisdom and push it down, you might end up in a place where you're like Solomon. I've had periods of time and seasons in my life of dryness, of pain, of heartache, of travail where I think, and it was all on me. God never moved. God never left his throne. God never said, I don't want to be in your presence as I welcome you into my presence. It was on me. The way Solomon got is our theme verse here. Because he says, I gave my heart to seek and to search out my wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. And then he continues, he says, you know what? This is a sword travail. Of course it's a sword travail. If you leave God out, it's painful. (laughs) It's a sore travail. It's painstaking misery, day to day a drudgery. Now, you maybe go a day or two and you haven't have that refreshment with the Lord, haven't spent time in His Word, maybe haven't spent time just in prayer and worship. I'm not talking about just driving down the road and having a little prayer time. I know that's cool, but it's going to be more than that because if that's all you got, then you're going to search and seek out things of God and it's going to be a sore travail because it's going to be under the sun. It's going to be under the heaven. It's going to be absent from the Lord Jesus Christ and his beautiful, perfect word. When you think about searching out for purpose and everything and saying, I need to search out for purpose, yes. Then today's 20 verses are going to include something about this purpose of folly versus wisdom. You're going to see that there's going to be a reference to foolishness or a fool or folly at least nine times here. You're going to see also, too, that wisdom is going to be Alluded to, being wise, a wise man, or wisdom, five times. So again, we're back to this wisdom versus foolishness. We're really going to hit it good today, though, because we've kind of interjected in each one of the messages because that's where the Spirit of God's led us. But today we're going to be right on point with something here. Because wisdom, if it becomes the way you and I can let it, can go bankrupt. Wisdom becomes Bankrupt. Let me fix my little thing here. When wisdom, like anything, becomes bankrupt, then it means that the follies of this life have now displaced again, replaced, pushed off wisdom. When wisdom goes bankrupt, why did you use that statement? Because we find that in the absence of wisdom, it's a bankrupt situation. You can't think clearly. You can't make the decisions you want to make of the Lord. You want to make some wisdom-filled decision on my next move. You're relying on your own brain power, possibly. You're relying on your experiences, possibly. You're relying on somebody's advice and experience, which is fine. But then you find yourself in a place of maybe foolish decisions, folly, foolhardiness, A place where there's foolish behavior. And one of the worst things that we can look in the mirror and see in ourselves is, boy, I'm being a fool. How could I end up being a fool? How could I look into the word of God and then walk away and forget what manner of man I am? In my flesh dwelleth no good thing, right? Would we not agree? That's what Paul the Apostle says. In this flesh. But I look up and I see the word of God in me. I see the Lord Jesus Christ in me, and I'm going, oh, that's wisdom. Because that's Jesus in me. That's the Holy Spirit of God in me. That's the Word of God in me. See, Solomon knew both sides. And today, as we think about what can happen when wisdom goes bankrupt, I want you to see in each one of our pieces. You see, Solomon's Proverbs are truly about wisdom and folly And when you read the Proverbs, like the Proverb of the day today, anybody read the Proverb of the day still, anybody? Once in a while, some of you, one or two of you, three of you, kind of, maybe. Okay, anyway, 
Proverbs 27, the proverb of the day. Boast, thy, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. It's a whole lot better for people to say something good about you than you to say something good about yourself. Verse 3, a stone is heavy, the sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than the both. That's not a bad proverb. Wrath is cruel, anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Solomon's Proverbs. Well, today's study, today's reading in chapter 10 is a lot of Proverbs. Again, it's proverbial or proverbial, or it's just a bunch of Proverbs. And here we see Solomon really pointing to this idea, you can have a wisdom-filled life, but again, if you lean to a place of neglecting it, of living in a place absent of God's wisdom, then it's going to become a foolish life. That's not something that I would want to be accused of being, a foolish person. There's a contradiction oftentimes when we see what Solomon's written in here to some of the things that are of the Word of God. And you say, why in the world does God contradict himself? No, he's not. Solomon is making statements that God himself allowed to be put in the Bible so that we can see what happens when we have this humanistic philosophy apart from God, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from his perfect word, and we say, ah, I'm going to figure it out. Ah, I've got it figured out. And we end up having these life moments of conflict of whether I should choose the wisdom of God or the vanity of myself and oftentimes, this human philosophy, apart from Jesus, is the way we lean. That's the way, oftentimes, Solomon is saying some of the things. Remember in Ecclesiastes 9, a couple weeks ago, the words of wise men are, har are heard in quiet, more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Read it again. The words of wise men are heard in quiet, more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. A good proverb that's followed by verse number 18. It says this, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. A couple of proverbs right there, a great pair of proverbs from Solomon. So you say, those make sense. Those are good godly statements. Yes, they are. But not always did Solomon have a God-leaning in his word. He didn't have a God side of things in his statements. But the words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. That's a great statement to have us realize that wise men can make a difference. Wise women can make a difference. People of wisdom in the Lord can make a difference. And when it says wisdom is better than the weapons of war, you get this. Because one sinner destroyeth much good. Think about all the good things that have gone on maybe in your family, in your church, maybe in your business, in your relationship, and then one, your best friend, and then one bad thing seemingly undoes a bunch of good. You know, the old phrase is, one bad customer makes more noise than a bunch of satisfied clients and customers. One customer, right, in the restaurant business, one person that says the food was bad. Oh, what about the other hundred people that were fine? My point again in this is that Solomon spoke a lot of wisdom, but oftentimes some of his statements were not of the wisdom of God. They were of him. They were in a place where it was truly vanity, vexation of spirit. It was folly and foolishness. God's wisdom is still the principal thing, and foolishness is still sin. It says in Proverbs 12, 23, a prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. Proverbs 19.3 
the foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, it says in Proverbs 22, 15. Proverbs 22, 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Do you have to teach a child how to be foolish? Maybe that's why I love to be around kids so much. I don't know. But they're fun sometimes. Their foolishness can be just play, so they're not being bad in a way. But when a kid becomes foolish and sinful, that's when it's difficult. Because the second part of that verse in Proverbs 22 says what? But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 24, 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. So you look up there and you say, well, you made that up, pastor. No, I didn't. God's wisdom is still the principal thing, and foolishness is still sin. The thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. I'm reminded of Solomon's incredible wisdom. He understands that wisdom is the principal thing, as it says in Proverbs 7. He wrote that. God told him, <coughs> because of what you've asked for, I'm going to give you an incredible heaping of it. Remember 1 Kings 3? You know. Behold, I have done according to thy words. You can write down the whole address and look the whole thing up. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. That's my God, your God, giving Solomon an incredible honor and privilege to be the wisest man. It said in 1 Kings chapter number 4, 29 through 34. 29, I'll read in 30. It says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much, and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Can you imagine? The largeness of his heart was even as the sand that is on the seashore. He had wisdom and understanding, and largeness, all three of those, as much as the sand on the seashore. It says in verse number 30, And Solomon's wisdom excelled, the wisdom of all the children of the east country, and the wisdom of Egypt. Verse 31, for he was wiser than all men. Yeah, that's the guy. Remember who he was? He was wiser than every man in the room. But what happens when wisdom is abandoned? What happens? Solomon abandoned wisdom. And ultimately, he forgot it. See, this life is one that brings us conflict at times over who we will please and who or what we will be satisfied with. A life that is satisfied for you, I know truly will be totally and completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you abandoned that quest and that search for the purpose of life and what it is that will satisfy you? Believers, have you abandoned the quest and search for wisdom? Have you forgotten wisdom? Have you uh, just said, ah, it's too difficult to find it? If you just allow the word of God day by day, week by week, hey, just start up again today. Start up this afternoon because you'll end up being in a place where wisdom will go bankrupt on you. Wisdom's not disappearing in completion, but wisdom goes bankrupt. When wisdom goes bankrupt, it's like anything else that's bankrupt. Think of this thought when I speak of this title. The definition of bankruptcy, or to be bankrupt. A person who becomes insolvent. A person who is completely lacking in a particular desirable quality or attribute. Whoa. A person who is completely lacking in a particular desirable quality or attribute. When wisdom goes bankrupt... It's as though you are bankrupt and your property is subject to voluntary or involuntary administration under somebody else in law. The benefit of all that you have and what you own is gone, and everything goes to the debtor. When something becomes bankrupt, you no longer have a possession of it. This morning, I pray and think and hope that we go through our 20 verses here for a minute. You consider what happens when wisdom goes bankrupt and how maybe today you're going to stop that process of bankruptcy of wisdom and say, God, I don't want to live in a place of folly. I don't want to live in a place of foolishness. We need to find where, God, we live in a place of wisdom. 
look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Let's walk it through here, verses 1 through 3. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. Ha <laughs> ha. We'll get back here in a moment. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. You see, if you're counting, you're a math person. You see the word folly, you see the word wisdom. Verse number two, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. The first three verses show me that business people need people. Why business people? What's an apothecary? Someone who deals with spices and perfumes. A businessman, a merchandiser. It's someone that, as Solomon's using this illustration, says, hey, what happens if dead fleas, excuse me, dead flies, not the fleas, the flies, cause the ointment of the apothecary to get in it and ruin it? Think of the plagues on Israel. There was fleas and there was flies. And you're reminded of what destruction they brought. They were like the flies of death or flies that produced death. Swarms of flies out of Exodus 8 were reminded it was a plague upon Egypt. There are many fools in life. And those that have business and are business people and feel like they're self-made think that nothing bad can happen to them. They've made it the way they've made it. They've, they've been successful. They've made it on the backs of others. But yet they say they're self-made people. Business people ought to be awake. They ought to realize that they need people. There are fools in business that say, hey, I don't need anybody. I made it without anybody. Well, the old thinking in the ancient world is that the left side would be the unlucky side. The right side would be the place of honor. It would be the place of power. Jesus Christ sits on the right hand of the Father. When you think of what he's saying here, yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that, is, that he is a fool. Many people, many people that are in business, in charge of people, or they've made money in a business, or they've had a lot of success, are susceptible to really being on an island all by themselves, thinking that nobody was here along the way for me. Who's going to be there for me? That can be a, a foolish thing to do. Because those that are around you and those that are near you can be a huge help to your continued success. We do not make money all by ourselves. We don't sustain things all by ourselves. Business people need people. Our next section is verses 4 through 7. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Verse number six, folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. Interesting. Folly is set in great dignity, rich sit in low place. Things get mixed up sometimes. Verse seven, I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Think about it. Verse 1 mentions fool or folly. Verse 2, same thing. Verse 3 mentions fool twice. Verse 6 mentions folly. You see, here's Solomon saying, this foolish life is on the other side of wisdom gone bankrupt. The second piece in our little devotion is rulers need guidance. So, business people need people Rulers need guidance. What do you mean? Well, think about the ruler that's in your life. How do you handle a difficult ruler? Some rulers are very proud. Some women, some men that are put in the position of ruling over people, ruling over government, ruling over the city, ruling over wherever. <coughs> they think, hey, I can do whatever I want. But a proud ruler, sometimes they do foolish things. And then... They lose the respect of all their associates. They lose, they lose people's ear. They lose the credibility. And they fail in that place. And it says in verse number four, when the spirit of a ruler rise up against thee, 
Leave not thy place. Deal with how he might stand up against you or she might. Say, hey, I'm going I'm to hold my ground. I'm not going to be mean-spirited. Yielding pacifies great offenses. It brings more and something worse on. Just handle that. It's not necessary for the servant now to act like fools. That's no need. Because there's an evil, it says in verse 5, which I have seen under the sun, an error which proceeds from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in lowly places. So on the other side of a proud ruler might be someone who is a little more passive or a little bit more agreeable, someone who says, hey, I'm pliable and workable. That's good too. But we have to be careful that as a ruler, that it's not so much pliability that folly sneaks in. He says in verse 7, I have seen servants upon horses, princes walking as servants upon the earth. It shows very simply that someone who's a ruler over things is maybe not going to be the high and mighty forever, that things may change up. Rulers need guidance on how to rule well. In their folly, they become arrogant, full of themselves, or maybe pliable, but way too pliable, and things then flip, and now there's no real accountability. Think of the time we're in and the way rulers are ruling. It shows you that ruling with wisdom from God is a whole lot better than the folly of man. We continue in verse number 8 through 11. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Isn't that nice? If you get through a hedge, there's a serpent on the other side that's going to bite you. Ah! Never happened there in Africa, didn't it? No. Verse number 9, whoso removeth stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge... Then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. Very simply, the babbler is someone who's not just a someone, but it's actually the word that means the tongue, an evil speaker, an instrument of speech. So it could be. That very simply, it's not just a person babbler, but rather the identification of the tongue. What do we got here? You know what? It says up on the screen that workers need direction. What's going on here? A snake charmer says, I can charm the snakes. I can handle certain things. He plays a little bit of a flute. Now, of course, we do know that there's no serpent or snake that has ears, right? Unless you've seen ears on one, maybe you've been watching too many cartoons. The ability to enchant or do something like that has something to do with this person that says, hey, I can handle this. It's by my movements and by things that I can do to figure it out. But it says, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. A babbler's no better. Going backwards to verse number 10, if the iron be blunt and do not wet the edge. It reminds me of Brian and Bobby telling stories of men in Africa who use certain instruments and tools to do things, and yet they basically destroy the cutting saw and dull it out and cannot accomplish the work because, and then they wonder why, well, they haven't wet it. Well, we can do the same, America or Africa. When you are working on something and the tools are not doing the job, you ought to step back and check your tools. Maybe you need to sharpen the tool. Maybe you need to check and see if it's operation. Workers need guidance. Here it's really coming from this. Verse 8, he digs the pit, he falls into it, he breaks a hedge, a serpent bites him. Hey, I can take care of things. You know those workers? You just, just show me where to go. I've cut this, I've done this. Don't, I, I've, you know what? I've done weed eating and I've worked for everybody. I can paint. Oh, everybody can paint. Sure. No, I don't think so. But the worker that says, I can do it all, then you find out they couldn't do it. When they find out, when you find out is when they've made a mistake and they broke something. Like when they come in and they say, hey, the lawnmower is broken. What happened? Well, there was no oil in it. Did you check the oil before you ran it? I didn't think I had to do it. Uh, 
You as a worker need direction before I fire you, okay? Here we go. Just kidding, gosh. I was just using me as an illustration. The next few verses, verse 12, here you go. The words of a wise man's lips, here we go, wise and foolish again, are gracious. A wise man's mouth is more gracious, isn't it? I like the words of a wise man. They're gracious. But the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. The end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell? The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Hmm. Talkers need discretion. Maybe this is you or maybe is someone that you've been around. First of all, you say that that first verse in verse 12 is nice. A wise man's words, they are full of grace. They are gracious. The way you can identify someone as being gracious is by the words they use. And not just once in a while, you're around them and they use gracious words. They use words that, as the word grace says, give people unmerited favor. They give things to people that they are not having to earn. When someone's words are like that, it's powerful and it's wonderful. That person is filled with grace. But it continues here with an illustration about the way people talk. See, talkers need discretion. Sometimes there's people that are just uncontrollable in the way they speak. They just can't... Mm. They've got to make something clear and they keep on going. Got to watch myself. We all got to watch ourselves and be cognizant of how we sound. We may become unreasonable, like it says in verse 13. Mischievous madness. The end of someone's talk that keeps on going like that is just mischievous madness. It's like, what, did you, what, what are you covering here? What are you talking about? And also, too, we see people that become a little bit boastful of themselves. As it says in verse 15, the labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. The person talks about how they are like this and like this, but who can tell them? As it then says in verse number 14 before that, who can tell him anything? Sometimes someone that just talks like that, you think, wow. Maybe it's that type of person that gets ready to answer something and retort back before a person is finished saying, you know, <laughs> when we don't hear the whole matter, it becomes, we become foolish. We need to hear a whole matter. And then lastly, verses 16 through 20, woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Remember, we've covered workers, talkers, businessmen, rulers. This group is going to be a, a bunch of people that are underneath the rulers. Continue with me, watch. As it says in verse 17, the second part of it, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness, verse 18. By much soft slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. You know if you leave things, it just dies off. Things fall apart. Verse 19 and 20, a feast is made for laughter, wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Curse not the king. No, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Ha. Huh. <coughs> Verse 20, then we'll go backwards. As it says up on there, officers need accountability. Officers are the people underneath the bosses. They're underneath the mayor. They're underneath the governor. They're underneath the pastor. They're underneath the boss. They're, they're the people and the officers, the deacons, the board of directors, the elders, whatever you want to say. And they're in that place where, hey, <clears throat> I have an opinion on things, and that's good. That's very good. That's something that should be healthy. 
But what he's saying is sometimes the officers, they become like the foolish rulers. And now, and they become foolish, they're bankrupt of wisdom. It's saying, hey, look out one day because you might be in that position where you're serving or you might be in that position where, hey, I could be the prince that becomes the ruler. And you're saying, wait a minute, son of nobles, the prince is eating deuce. Hey, I deserve a little benefit here. I mean, the rulers are getting everything. What about me? Do I get something? He's also saying, as you look at verse number 18, watch out for not doing your job. Because officers need accountability. Not to always say, I need more. I need more. I need to be paid more. Not to say, hey, everybody else should do the work where it's my job. And then when he says, hey, officers need accountability, he's saying, hey, look, sometimes people like that in that position become apathetic. I don't care. I don't care. Solomon's saying, don't become like that. Because that statement of proverb here is pointing to the idea that those people under the rulers, those people under, underneath the governing headship, they need to have some wisdom and they need to watch how they are supporting or not supporting. Because at the end there, verse number 20 is saying, hey, I was just, you know, talking a little bit about things. I wasn't really complaining and stuff. And then that little phrase there. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. You ever heard that phrase, a little birdie told me? Somehow, some way. Some of those things come all the way back around. We all have experienced that. When wisdom goes bankrupt, then each one of these things that we've looked at in our few minute, our 20 minute devotion really hit us. That Solomon speaking of a folly life versus a wisdom filled life. Once again, he's hitting us with some proverbs. He's saying, hey, officers need accountability. Businessmen need people. They're not self-made. Talkers, they need discretion. Workers, you kind of need some, you need some dir direction on what you need to do. When he comes down to it, though, as our title today, in the last couple of minutes here, it's something for us right now that really, to me, reverberates. It hits me here with the idea that when when wisdom goes bankrupt, it leads again to the place of old Solomon that we've looked at more than once. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 11. We've looked at some verses out of here. Today I'm going to use verses 26 through 40 and finish up our study on chapter 11 and what we have as our practical application from his life. Because 1 Kings... Chapter number 11, 10, 9, 8 have been a great source for us in the Word by the Spirit to show us the lessons that we need from the man who's preaching this message and God's recording it in His Word. The man that wrote all the, the Proverbs, the man that wrote the Song of Solomon, the man that was so in love with Jesus, so in love with God that he said this world is not even that important because my love and passion for the Lord Jesus is more important than anything else, the Song of Solomon. And then the Proverbs with all the wisdom and all this insight. But here we have Ecclesiastes and we wonder how we got there. Well, we're, we're beginning to find the answer and it comes from Solomon's life near the end as we have progressed through a little bit of 1 Kings. The first thing I want you to see of two simple lessons is this. When wisdom goes bankrupt, the oneness of God with the people of God becomes division. It becomes division throughout the kingdom. We're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We are the body of Christ. We are his local ecclesia. We fit underneath God working his work in the kingdom. Jesus Christ said, one day my kingdom will completely be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus Christ reigning on the throne. He's reigning right now in glory. 
And we have to be reminded as you go back to Israel and see that Solomon once again is his anointed king. He is God's guy. He is the one that was put in place. And now near the end of his life, God's saying the oneness and unity of the people of God, you know what? I'm going to divide it. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Whew! This is a tough pill to swallow, but it is the truth. Because this kingdom is all unified under King Solomon. But he's ready to die, and then it's going to be divided. How did it get divided? God said ahead of time, this is the way I'm going to divide it. Jeroboam and Rehoboam. It should have all gone to the sun next. But God says no. 1 Kings chapter number 11, verse number 26. Just follow along with me. I'll make a couple of comments, and then we'll move to our second lesson and be done. It says in verse number 26, And Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, an Ephraimite of Zereda, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilamite, Shilamite found him in the way. And he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rented in 12 pieces. He caught it, it was on him, he rented in 12 pieces, and he said to Jeroboam, take thee 10 pieces. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe, for my servant David's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Remember, the one tribe is actually two, that small little tribe called Benjamin. Sorry, not to be, you know, but small tribe. Along with Judah in Jerusalem. Remember, this is the ten tribes. God is separating and dividing the kingdom. It's all one. Now he's dividing it. Why? Because shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen of all the tribes of Israel, because, 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 that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as David his father. What a great reminder, a stark reminder that when wisdom goes bankrupt in Solomon's life, the oneness of God with the people of God becomes division. God says, I'm going to decide what's going to be, and I'm going to bring a division in the kingdom. Please consider how bad things can get in our lives. If we get to a place where we abandon wisdom, we neglect wisdom day after day, the wisdom of God, we rely on our own strength, we rely on our own experience, we rely on the wisdom of man. We listen to this person, we listen to that person. Don't forget, hey, in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. Just make sure you have the right kind of counselors that are going to use the word of God, because this is where the counsel comes from. But when you get to a point where all you've got is you, all you've got is the wisdom of man, then it's going to become folly eventually. I'm concerned, so concerned, that as time walks out and walks on, as the weeks go on and the months go on, we rely so much on the wisdom of this world. And it becomes folly. We believe so many things of the world, and yet we don't believe God. That's totally contradictory. We trust in the Lord. We don't just try out the Lord. We trust in him. Not trying, trusting. We're saying, okay, Lord, I need to keep this oneness going with you, and God's people need to keep this oneness going with you. We don't need a division in the kingdom of God. We need God to show us that the wisdom is to bind us together 
And Solomon lost track of his wisdom. The second lesson, and I'll be done, comes from this thought right here. Stay right in your passage. We'll pick it up in verse number 34. When wisdom goes bankrupt, the judgment of God comes upon the man of God. You say, I know this, but it's clear from your word. It's clear from the Bible that the judgment of God comes upon the man of God who has forgotten the holiness of God. This is when it becomes convicting for every one of us. Because the judgment of God can come upon any of us. I'm not saying God is sitting at, in the throne just waiting to punish you. That's not what I'm saying. God is so gracious. He's slow to anger. He's rich in mercy. Read Psalm 103. And so many other. The Psalms are filled with his mercy that endureth forever. But there are principles in place where God says, I may decide today, it's up to God, to judge a matter. And it comes upon the man of God here in this case who has forgotten the holiness of God. He became bankrupt in his wisdom. He had all the wisdom. He was the wisest man on the face of the earth. It says in verse number 34 down to 40, and I'm done. I'll remind you of what 41 through 43 say because we covered those last time in the death of Solomon. How be it, verse 34, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will take him prince all the days of his life for David, my servant's sake, whom I chose because he kept my statutes, commandments and statutes. But I will take this kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give one tribe, that David my servant may have a light alway before me in Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? The temple, the place of worship, it's Judah. The city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that my soul desireth, and shall be king over Israel, and shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee. And will walk in my ways. And, I, and do that is right in my sight. I keep my, to keep my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did. Verse 38. That I will be with thee. And build thee a sure house as I built for David. And will give Israel unto thee. And I will for this afflict the seed of David. But not forever. And Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam. And Jeroboam arose, fled into Egypt, unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. When wisdom goes bankrupt, the judgment of God comes upon the man of God who has forgotten the holiness of God. And that can be upon any of us. The last three verses. Solomon's gone. It says he served for 40 years as the king, and he's dead. What an incredible life this Solomon had from the very beginning that he wrote it to a very difficult end. My encouragement today as we walk into the Lord's Supper is let's search and seek out God's wisdom together. It says up on the screen this. Remember and examine. That's what we do with the Lord's Supper. We remember what Jesus Christ did for us, and we examine what we are at, where we are at, how we are at with him and others. What are you doing daily? What am I doing daily to pursue the wisdom of God before becoming bankrupt? Do you want to become bankrupt? In wisdom? Oh, gosh, no. We need wisdom from God. He will implant it in you if you stay by his word. He will put it in you in ways that you go, we wake up one day and go, that obviously wasn't me speaking. You're right, it was God's word. You want to have some wisdom from God? Then just say what he says. You want to sound like you're wise? Have grace? Use the words that Jesus used. Because as we... Go into prayer. This is what it says up on the screen. 
during the Lord's Supper, let us be mindful of our need for unified worship in the presence of his holiness. Would you please stand with me, be in an attitude of prayer?